On Chad's second week in the marina, a liveaboard named Barry motored his sailboat, dubbed the Stillwater, from its slip several spots upstream to the fuel dock. Chad saw him and rushed out of the store to help secure the boat. But by the time Chad got to the edge of the dock, Barry was already done tying off the bow and stern lines. Chad said hi and tried to get a conversation going, but Barry wasn't very talkative and walked away toward the store. Chad asked, Can I get some fuel going for you? Nah, I'll take care of it in a minute, said Barry. I can get it started for you, at least. Barry stopped and turned to look at Chad. Fine. Ten gallons. Gasoline. And he walked into the store. Chad picked a nozzle off the fuel pump unscrewed the fuel cap off the side of the boat and started the pump. He waited by the boat and watched the numbers roll by on the pump's readout to ten dollars even. Barry came out the door just as Chad finished hanging up the green diesel nozzle. Barry froze halfway to the boat. What kind of fuel did you just put in my tank? Chad's heart surged. Diesel? You've got a sailboat with a diesel engine, right? Barry closed his eyes. Chad looked at the boat. I thought all sailboats had diesel engines. Barry opened his eyes and spoke calmly and quietly. No, not all sailboats have diesel engines. Mine, for instance. Chad's heart sank lower in his chest. His eyes reddened. We can pump it out of there, right? Barry opened his mouth, then closed it again. He folded his arms. Nah, no need to go through all that trouble. I can probably dip a hose in there and run it to the diesel outboard for a while. Don't worry about it. I've got a diesel heater inside, too. I could feed it to that. Rick came out of his office and stood behind Barry. Chad confessed what he had done, red-faced looking down toward their thin canvas deck shoes. I'll fix it. I'll get a pipe or a hose or something and siphon it out. I'm really sorry, you guys. It, it probably could have happened to anybody. This isn't the first screw-up like this, Rick said. That's a relief, said Chad. I wasn't talking to you, said Rick. He turned to Barry. This isn't the first dumbass mistake Chad's made since he got here. How much fuel was in there when you came in? Half the tank, said Barry, but it's not a big deal. Rick put his arm around Barry and drew him toward the store. Okay, no problem then. I'll give you a bottle of this fuel additive that will turn that mixture into supreme grade fuel. Clean your engine out, too. I've used it a hundred times. The men disappeared into the office and shut the door behind them. Chad stood next to the fuel pump and looked at his hands, as if unsure what they were or what to do with them. His heart thumped in his ears. He would just go. Moving out here was a terrible idea. Halfway to nowhere, where he didn't know anybody, where people eyed him with suspicion, where he felt himself holding his breath on the walk down the ramp to this floating world because the transition onto water actually scared him where the rocking of the walkways and the bell-like tones of ropes banging into masts and the smell of diesel and all his fuck-ups and trying to fit in just reminded him of his granddaddy of a fuck-up and his wrecked marriage and his wrecked boat, that piece of shit boat that not even a salvage yard wanted any more, where he slept in a sleeping bag like a hobo, not even making enough money to start paying down his student loans. He should just go... Leave the landlocked boat for Rick and his boatyard crew to break into pieces. Or he could set it on fire and walk up to the highway and hitch a ride to who the fuck cares. A raspy female voice beside the fuel dock spoke loudly, more loudly than necessary. Chad jumped, startled. Woohoo! That was great! Chad scanned the picnic tables and deck chairs over near the hot dog stand on the side deck for the speaker. He looked back and forth as if lost. Over here! Under a large yellow picnic umbrella, Doris stepped out from behind the main counter of the stand. Come here, honey, she said, her eyes wrinkled in concern. 
Her bare arms reached out from her frayed jean vest. The leathery brown skin on her arms hung loosely around her bones, and it swung back and forth from where it sagged above the elbows. If you can believe it, young man, that's more than I've heard coming out of Barry's mouth in all the years he's been moping around this place. She reached toward Chad with a hand that carried a lit cigarette between the pinky and ring fingers. Chad watched out for the cigarette as she put her hand on his shoulder and shook him lightly. Chad opened his mouth, tried to speak, but no words came. Doris, they called her Dory on the docks, ran a hot dog stand now and then on the fuel dock. She was often there for lunch and part of the afternoon, but her hours were, as she put it, whenever the hell she felt like it, usually as long as the conversations on the dock were interesting enough. Chad said, You're Dory, right? Well, it's been nice knowing you. I think I'm fired now. Dory threw back her head and cackled. Are you kidding me? No, you're not. And even if you were, I wouldn't let it happen. How do you know? I can just tell, honey. You just go right back in that store, walk up to Ricko the Dicko, and tell him he's late in picking up my jars of sauerkraut like he said he would. Go on. She waved toward the store. Don't you worry about it. Tell him I'm going to pour the nasty old sauerkraut my customers have been stuck with, all of it, right down into one of his file drawers, if he doesn't hurry the hell up. Chad looked Dory in the eyes and half smiled. Thanks. Dory winked at him. You're all right, Chad, and she walked back toward the picnic tables. Chad went into the store and over to the shelf where Barry and Rick were discussing oil and fuel treatments, and stood right by them, with his arms folded. He wasn't going to shy away from them, but he wasn't going to talk about sauerkraut, either. They spoke for a while without acknowledging Chad, but he couldn't concentrate on what they were saying anyway. He kept searching back over the past few days, trying to think of what else he might have done wrong that would lead Rick to say, not the first time. What had he done? What had he fucked up? Put the wrong fuel in someone else's tank? Count someone's change wrong? Something he had said? Eventually, Barry turned to leave. He reached out his hand to Chad, and Chad shook it. Don't lose sleep over this, Barry said. We all screw up sometimes. He sighed and closed the door behind him on his way out. Rick turned to his desk, picked up the phone, and dialed a number. He turned toward Chad while it rang, and said, I saved your butt, young man. Guess you won't do that again. Before Chad could respond, Rick spoke in a jovial tone to a boatyard customer on the other end about a boat repair job that was ready to be paid for. Chad sat down at his desk and stared at the spreadsheet of boat tenants on the dimly lit computer screen. The rounded glass of the old monitor reflected more light from the windows and door behind him than it displayed from inside. He watched the reflection of gulls and the wind ruffling the canvas that hung above the doors and windows. 